students from the, my, my class. We've got a few uh, strangers in the back row. They're from a, a visiting school. Andrew, can you introduce the school? And, uh, yeah, we were, these are all economic students, uh, first year economics at uh, Salesian School in Chelsea. Yeah, so I thought they'd come along and get a, a bit of a dose of my approach to economics, uh, which I've actually brought up there on screen. And next week, we, you know, we, we had last week, we were supposed to have that talk on uh, how to p display statistics. We'll play that to next week. That might make some confusion with the tutorial outline. I'm sorry about that, but just circumstantial thing with the program not being properly communicated to the staff member who's going to, to teach that. So anyway, uh, what I want to talk about today is the, the mainstream approach to economic modelling. And I want to put a bit of a caveat here. I'm going to be telling you, certainly the school students at the back and also my own students to some extent, some stuff you haven't yet learnt is wrong. Okay, So stuff you're going to do in future courses, I'm going to say, has got fundamental errors to it, uh, which you will potentially get taught at Kingston. You would not get taught at, at most other universities. It'll just be glossed over and ignored. Here you might get it, but at the same time you might be asked to pass exams on the stuff that I'm going to say is wrong. Okay. Now, my set suggestion to that is it's, I often find students, when they, if they get taught this normal mainstream stuff, and for some reason it doesn't quite gel in their minds and they criticise themselves and they try to do exams and they, they can't answer the questions and they blame themselves for not understanding the material. Uh, it's actually the material doesn't make sense. Okay. But if you, if you see that, then you can take a look at somebody who believes it does make sense when they set an exam question and say, OK, this is what the person believes. This is like, this is like a crazy game of chess, you know, where the Queen um, can move in circles rather than actually in straight lines. Well, I'll just, you know, pretend the Queen can move in circles and I'll answer the question properly, even though I know it's wrong. So that's what I suggest you, you take this approach to, because a whole lot of what you're going to learn in economics, I'm going to say, is simply wrong, OK? But you've still got to pass exams on it. So accept that it's wrong. It actually makes it easier to pass the exam, I think. Well, we'll see how we go. And if you want to interrupt me at any point, please go ahead and do it. Now. Economists distinguish themselves from other social sciences by trying to build models of the economy, which are mathematical or computer representations of the world they're trying to understand. Sociologists often do that as well, by the way. There's some sociologists who, for example, I know one who models prison populations and the, what's likely to cause a breakout of violence in a prison using very sophisticated techniques. So it's not that economics is the only one but it's the one which most emphasises doing mathematical modelling. And what I want to show you here is a table that compares what the mainstream thinks is the right way to do economic modelling with the approach to the school of economic thought that I take. So this is uh, summarising some views from Paul Krugman on one side and a range of people on the other. And Paul, do you know the name Paul Krugman? Some of you do. What about the students in the back there? Okay. He's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. He writes a column for the New York Times. And he's just recently republished a, uh, a discussion he had when he spoke at an evolutionary biology conference back in the late 90s. And he was saying what economics is about. And that's where I've taken uh, those two quotes from on the, on the left-hand side. So he says that economics is about what individuals do. It's not about social classes, workers, capitalists, bankers, and things like that. Uh, or correlations of forces, and a lot of critics of economics will talk about uh, um, global level forces and so on. He says, no, it's not about that. It's got to be grounded in individual behaviour. What he calls methodological individualism is of the essence. And what that means is they believe they have to start from describing an individual and then aggregate from that to the macro level so they can describe the macro economy. That's how, that's how they think you should do modelling. Uh, pardon me, I mean to move that back up again. What happened there? OK. OK. Sometimes this mouse behaves in strange ways. I don't quite know why. OK. My approach, and the approach that you'll find a lot of uh, critics taking, is more what's said by the bloke on the, on the right-hand side there, ironically, Karl Marx. And this is a quote from him, one of his famous papers in the 19th century. And he says, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They don't make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already transmitted from the past. So in other words, history and the structure of society constrain what individuals can do, even if individuals are the 
individual other agents, the actors in an, e in an economy. So that's arguing we should be perhaps looking at the history and the structure of the economy rather than starting from the individual. Then in terms of the process, how do you actually, having got a, a model defined, say, individuals on one side and on this side, the, the, this, the uh, heterodox side, you've just described the structure of the economy, how do you proceed from there? Well, Krugman again says, I'm a maximisation and equilibrium kind of guy. And what he means is you, having described your individual agents, how they're supposed to behave, uh, or you, or what constitutes the individual agent? So for consumers, they'll talk about consumers having a set of tastes which decide what they would like to buy, and then an income uh, which gives them the capacity to, to afford what can be bought, and relative prices. So that's the mix they put together to define a consumer. And for a firm, they'll talk about a firm having a demand curve, the, the, what it can sell on the market at various prices and its cost of production and they put those together and then having done that they'll say well the individual will maximise their utility given the constraint of their income and relative prices and the firm will maximise its profits given the constraints of market demand or the demand that it sees from the market and its individual costs so that's and then they work out the equilibrium where you, the idea of an equilibrium You'll often see talk about marginal this and marginal that. If you, the school students have seen that so far, marginal cost, okay. What that's like is saying the slope of a hill. If you imagine uh, that there's two ways you can walk um, up a mountain, one is to go over the top, the other is to go through a valley and come up, and you've, you've gone into the same point. You can regard the, the revenue, it's the, from the, in that particular point, the revenue for the firm in that case as being like taking the upward way and the cost like taking the bottom way. And what you're trying to do, the gap between the, the revenue and your cost is your profit. Okay, So the maximum profit comes when the gap between those two paths through a mountain is the maximum gap. Now if there's a smoothly increasing bottom, bottom path that goes down and then goes up, which is the cost way, or there's the revenue which rises rapidly and then comes down, the maximum gap between the two is when the slopes of the two lines are, the, the slopes are parallel. That's the whole idea of marginal cost and marginal revenue. It maximises the gap between the two. Okay? So that's the sort of vision that they have. And they say, once you've worked out the behaviour, the, the, the two factors that determine what the firm's going to do, one is the, the cost, the other is the revenue, you equate the marginals and you maximise the gap. And the equilibrium will apply where you've got that maximum gap. The firm's always going to go back to that point. That's the sort of thinking they have. Well, the bloke I've quoted on the uh, right-hand side there, an alternative approach, I'm kind of calling copying complex systems dynamics, is a person called Schumpeter. Have you heard that name before? Okay, you're going to hear a lot more about him in the courses that we teach at Kingston. And he was the father of what's called evolutionary economics, taking the approach that Darwin had to how species have evolved and applying that to how the firm behaves as well. And he wrote, rather than talking about maximisation and equilibrium, he says any system transforms itself simply by its mere workings. And if history teaches us nothing else, it teaches us that. In other words, you're not in a state of equilibrium. We're always changing and going through time. And then, um, finally, I don't talk about that uh, so much this week's lecture. I'll talk more about that for next week's lecture of the, uh, on alternative approaches. Well, actually, that'll be the week after it, quite possibly. We'll have to shuffle the uh, program a bit. Uh, they leave the, the mainstream leaves out banks and debt and money. They don't play any essential role in how they think about the macroeconomy. From my point of view, it's fundamentally monetary. Now, why bother comparing different approaches to economics? I mean, you, nobody compares different approaches to physics, for example, or chemistry. Now, there's a, a, a generally agreed philosophy inside those disciplines. Physics has a lot of camps developing right now. It has People who work at the very small called quantum mechanics, those who work at the large scale using what's called relativity, they are inconsistent, and people in both those areas know they're inconsistent, they're trying to resolve that. So there are different brands, but they all generally agree on all the various techniques, and nobody in relativity uh, dismisses what quantum mechanics people do. They just know that that has to be done working on a small scale. Nobody in quantum mechanics just dismisses what the people in relativity do. They know they've got to use that at the large scale, um, so there are differences in different divisions, but they, in different uh, uh, sciences, but they accept that each one is legitimate. Well, in economics, there's a mainstream that thinks they've got the only way one can think about the economy, and that's what I'm showing on the on the left-hand column there at Krugman's ideas. 
And there are critics who say you've got it all wrong. We shouldn't be using that at all on the other side. So there is this conflict in economics. And it wasn't all that visible to the public before the financial crisis back in 2008. But it became visible then because many of the people of the mainstream told us the economy was going to be fantastic in 2008 and 2009. They saw no sign of any problem. In fact, they thought the economy was going to be nice and stable forevermore. And then the crisis hit. Well, that gave a bit of visibility to the to the critics. So what I want to do now is um, talk about how the micro theory that the neoclassicals go, how does it work? Well, they start from the idea of an isolated consumer on one side to derive a demand curve. And that the individual, if you, if, again, the school students, have you heard of what they call in, uh, in, indifference curves? Yeah. Okay. My, my group is... Okay, you've done a bit of indifference curves. What indifference curves are like are a bit like the... Um, you know when you look at the weather map and you'll see the, the, the lines drawn to show lines of equal pressure, which are called isobars? When you see like a high, a high pressure system and a low pressure system, you see that on TV all the time. Okay. Well, it's saying if you followed one of those lines around, no matter where you were in England, if you went around the 990 millibar line, the air pressure would be exactly the same all the way through there. Well, the indifference curve is supposed to be the same thing for a consumer. The idea is that a consumer's got a whole range of commodities that they can decide to buy, and different combinations of those can be shuffled so that the, the satisfaction the person is getting out of consuming is the same no matter which combination they consume. So that's a concept that economists have sort of stolen from, um, from uh, meteorology, and they call it indifference curves as a way of representing what your tastes are. They then talk about a budget constraint. So they say you've got a given income, and there's the income you've got. We're not going to change the income in this exercise as we try to work out what your demand's going to be, given the combination of your tastes and your income. And then what they do is they say, well, let's just change the relative prices. Imagine you're looking at two goods. Let's say they're uh, uh, MP3 files and uh, cans of Coke between the two. And they're saying, let's vary the relative price of MP3 files versus Coke and see what happens. Do you, how many more um, cans of Coke do you buy as Coke gets cheaper relative to buying another music track? Um, and then out of that, they derive an individual demand curve. So this is a curve that represents what an individual will do if prices change. And they then extrapolate that to the market and say, well, this, this individual behavior, which will work out with an isolated consumer, scales up to the market and scales up to the overall economy as well. And you get a, this curve slopes downwards, which means that if you increase the price of something, you reduce the demand. Or if you drop the price, you increase the demand. That's the idea of being downward sloping. And that's seen, it's done for the micro level. It's also fundamentally what's going on when they do a model of the entire economy and talk about what happens as you change uh, incomes and change prices and change uh, what actually happens to the level of total demand. Now, for a, a firm on the other side, the, the, one side they're working out what comes from demand, the other side they're working out what comes from supply, and they take an individual kind of firm again, and they say the firm has got a set of fixed costs and a set of variable costs, and the firm faces what's called diminishing marginal productivity. Now, I imagine all my university students have heard of that. The school students? Heard that concept or not yet? That'll be coming along shortly. And that ends up saying that the firm will maximise its profits by setting its output level to be the same as its, what's called its marginal cost, and that's seen as rising. So the cost of producing each input rises over time. Uh, I know this is pushing the school students a fair bit, but let's you know, hopefully you can do the repair work back at uh, the end of the, back at school, Andrew. Uh, so the market demand curve adds up all those marginal cost curves, and you get an upward sloping market supply curve, and that's the same as for the macro models as well, and everything's about equilibrium between those two. Now, I want to just put a little thought in your mind here, because what they're saying is you start from an isolated consumer and you build a demand curve, and you start from an isolated firm and you build a supply curve, and then you can do and talk about what happens at the market level or the firm, at the industry level, or the economy level, just as an extrapolation from the behaviour of those isolated individuals. And everything you need to know about the aggregate level is contained in the, the lower level. Well, imagine if I set you um, an exercise about water and said, OK, 
Can we do the same thing with water? Now, water consists of this molecule that has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. We call it H2O. Okay? And we all know, uh, if you walk outside in England on a bad day, you know one particular form of water. It's drizzle, okay? sometimes called rain. If you fall in the Thames, it's wet. Okay? If it gets really cold, there'll be ice floating on the Thames. So it becomes a solid. But it's an unusual solid because it actually is less dense than the li liquid it comes from. And heated enough, it becomes steam. And of course, there's this crazy state of, of, uh, of, of water called snow, H2O called snow. Can you derive all of those as properties of an individual atom, of H2, uh, a molecule of H2O? So is there, in other words, is just a single molecule of H2O have an ice state, a water state, a sleet state, a snow state, etc., etc.? And the answer is no. It doesn't have any of those characteristics on its own. The only way you can actually get those various properties out of masses and masses of H2O, identical molecules, is how they interact with each other. So some of the amazing peculiarities of water come out of the fact that these interacting molecules behave in very strange ways. So two, several molecules of H2O together, if you cool them down, at a certain point they start becoming a solid crystalline structure, but that crystal has actually got, occupies more uh, volume than the liquid it came from. Whereas most things, if you freeze, for example, if you have molten steel, and you start freezing molten steel, the molten steel, will, the, when it becomes solid, will fall to the bottom. But in water, if you freeze, start to freeze water, the frozen stuff floats to the top. Again, the fact that it forms snow, these are weird interactions of thousands and millions of, mole of, of molecules of H2O in a single snowflake. So these are, the only way you can derive these properties of water is by analysing the whole mass and looking at the interactions between the elements. You can't understand water by working from an isolated molecule of H2O. So what economists do doesn't apply here. It would be fundamentally wrong to try to derive the properties of water by working from an isolated molecule of H2O. And that applies even though those are absolutely identical molecules. So it doesn't necessarily follow that if you know what happens with the isolated ele element, you can extrapolate to the mass. It doesn't apply with water. So why should it apply with economics? Well, they believe it does, but they're actually wrong on it. Now, we know, let's take a look at the man first and how they drive all this stuff. We know that for most products, if you drop the price, the demand's likely to rise. And obviously, there are snob value goods. You make some things more expensive, they're more desirable. So Louis Vuitton uh, handbags are more desirable than ones you might get from um, Sainsbury's or oh God knows. I was, you know, John, I'm still learning all the shop names here. John Lewis, perhaps? Okay. Okay. Um, but most goods will accept if you drop the price of, uh, of corn, people are going to buy more corn. Or drop the price of bread, they might, might, try, might buy more bread. So we do tend to accept that. But can the theory explain it? Well, it starts for a single consumer, and it can actually explain a single consumer demanding less bread as the price of bread rises. But how do you go from an individual curve to a market curve? Now, what the theory will show you is that it's simply a case of adding up these horizontal lines, or the declining lines. You've already derived a downward sloping demand curve for an individual. You just add them up and you get the market demand curve. End of story. That's all most of your textbooks will teach you. And one thing I want, uh, we, we certainly were doing at Kingston, and I want the school students to think the same way, you should be able to trust textbooks. You certainly can in areas like physics and mathematics and so on. In economics, I don't believe you can. There are all sorts of problems that they, they gloss over. They don't tell you the problems. You can find the problems by reading the original papers from which these things were derived in economics. So I do re I really emphasise to my students at Kingston to read original papers. Even if you've got lots of mathematics you can't understand, read the logic, read the verbal explanation around them and you'll get a better idea than ever out of the textbooks. Now, when this is done for an individual demand curve, what's, what's actually done to derive a demand curve is you believe in working with an individual. The individual is so small that changing relative prices doesn't affect that individual's income or does it affect the income of the rest of society. So you think you can 
when you're working out a demand curve for an individual, the assumption is that you can change the prices of things without particularly changing that person's income. And that's fair enough when you're taking one person in isolation. So if I took you and let's say one of you, you know, had earned say twenty thousand pounds a year, and I then said, well, let's see what your demand's going to be for, um, you know, again, I'll bet MP3 files versus uh, Coke. If I vary the relative price of MP3 files and Coke, changing those prices won't have much impact upon your income. So it's okay to ignore any feedback between changing those prices and changing your income, an individual. But you can't assume that when you go to the level of the overall market. If I say I'm going to change the price of MP3 files and change the price of Coke, then those things do shuffle income. So I could use better examples than that. I could use um, changing the price of bread, for example, or changing the price of labour. Okay? Those things will change incomes. Because prices determine incomes. If we made MP3 files a lot cheaper, then uh, you know the various stars we all... What's that one? The, uh, I can't think of a name right now, but uh, uh, say Brianna would get less money for each of the downloads you make than she gets right now. If you change, you drop the price by a factor of two, or if you paid less for Coke, etc., etc., or more for Coke, that would change relative in change incomes as well. But what is actually done is to represent, and this I, I know is pushing the, the, what the school students know, the tastes, uh, the, the joke that I'm using here is I just look about demand for bananas. Okay. One of the, I, I, I tend to choose silly examples for uh, the commodities. I see the theory is silly itself. So here's how many bananas somebody's likely to buy versus all the other things they can purchase on the vertical axis. And the way that um, conventional theory represents people's um, tastes for different goods is to say, well, we can work out that you might actually be willing to, if, if you had lots and lots of other stuff and only very few bananas, that would give you your, your, your utility, the amount of pleasure you got from consuming goods could be represented as being this point here and this point shows no utility at all. You don't consume anything. Way out here, lots of utility, lots of consumption. So the further out you move here, it's like getting higher and higher pressure working with isobars on a on a meteorology map. So here's a particular position where you can be lots of other stuff and almost no bananas. And if I go down here and have you consuming lots of bananas and almost nothing else, you're re equal amount of satisfaction. Okay. That's the way they try to represent it. And then what they say is, well, if we take your income as being fixed and we then vary the price of bananas, then the relative price of bananas compared to everything else, if bananas are really expensive, is this very steep line here. Okay, So if that steep line applies and you spend all your money on other goods, that's the amount of other stuff you could buy. But if you spend all your money buying bananas, that's the amount you could buy, and the straight line links the two. And then given that, we'll say, well, given that budget constraint, and that's what that particular line is seen as being, then the maximum satisfaction you can actually get is on this curve W because there's a point of tangency here between that curve and that straight line. So this that's as best you can do. And if you chose a combination down here, for example, you'd be getting less utility than up there. So your utility maximizing point is that particular point. Then you choose a cheaper price for bananas. So if you this is this this particular flatter line says you can buy more bananas with the same income. So bananas are cheaper. Well in that case you can go to a higher level of utility. So you're going to end up on this particular curve and choose that point and then cheaper still you'll choose that point. Does that roughly make sense? You're going to get this again maybe not at high school but you'll get it when you come to university. So the, therefore what you've done we have three relative prices that's a very expensive price a medium price and a cheap price for bananas and then you've got three points that the consumer decides to consume a small amount a larger amount and a larger amount still and what you've done is then derive the beginnings of getting a demand curve for that individual. And the assumption you're making, as I've emphasised beforehand, is assuming changing those prices has no impact upon your income. And that's fair enough. If I imagine if I change prices bananas drastically, what's the likelihood that changing the price of bananas is going to come back and affect the income you earn? It's reasonable to say we can isolate that out there. So that's okay for a single consumer. But if you do it for everybody, for more than one consumer, 
then when you change those prices, you're changing incomes of people actually produce bananas. You've got to change, therefore. When you change the price of bananas, you do change their income. So you can't uh, abstract when you start working at the level of the entire society. You've got to say that now changing relative prices will change incomes. So that means when you go from working with an isolated individual to working with the whole society, you can no longer make that assumption that varying prices did not vary incomes. So what does that mean to the, the issue? Well, changing the relative prices and changing incomes means that the budget constraint doesn't stay where it is. If I now, not for everybody, if I change those relative prices now, rather than, I'll just go back and show the previous curve again. When I'm doing this exercise, notice that even at the point of intersection down here moves when I change the relative price, but that pivot point remains exactly there where it is. It doesn't move. Now, when you go to looking at a whole, industry, a whole economy, then that point's going to move for every person every time you change relative prices. Okay? It won't stay there. The price change will affect that person's income somehow. You've got to then change the point. So rather than everything rotating around here, you're going to go up and down occasionally. So that's a serious mathematical problem now. We know that with assuming that it's fixed, you can derive a downward sloping demand curve. What about when we say it's not? Well, some serious mathematical economists of the mainstream, these are some of the names there, Gorman, Sonnenschein, Mantel, de Brewer, and Schaefer, the, the middle three are the ones this is actually named after in the literature. They said, under what conditions will the market demand curve have the same properties as the individual? And this is a bit like saying, under what conditions will a whole body of H2O molecules behave exactly the same way as an isolated one. Okay? Well, quite complicated. And what they started from is saying, well, the, what they, they call, they talk about the law of demand. And that says, prices, as prices fall, demand will rise. A negative relationship between the quantity demanded and the price that things are sold for. And they concluded it doesn't apply when you look at the entire economy. Uh, this looks like this is a complicated statement. They say we prove that every polynomial is an excess demand function for some specified commodity in some n commodity economy. What the hell does that mean? Okay. Looks complicated, doesn't it? What they're saying is that a polynomial is a plus bx plus cx squared plus dx cubed plus bx to the fourth, etc., etc. And if you use a um, if you use a polynomial. You can, you know, like a, a, a y equals a times x is a straight line. Y equals ax plus ax plus bx squared is going to be a, a, is going to be a, a parabola in some shape, okay, with a straight line added to it. Y equals ax plus bx squared plus cx cubed is going to be up and down three. If you use those curves and go out for x to the nth power, it might be a hundred you can get any shape you like at all, which you can draw by during a line on a, on a page without taking your finger off the, without taking the pen off the paper and without intersecting the line and without going directly above the line. So you've got to be going along, up or down, but so long as you do that, any curve at all, you can fit using a polynomial. So what they're saying is, using starting from conventional economic theory, and starting from individuals who all have that property of the downward sloping individual demand curve, when you add up and get the market level, you get a squiggly line, not a downward sloping curve. Okay. Now, that is a remarkable conclusion, and you think it would turn up in the textbooks, but it doesn't. So, this uh, argument goes like this. If you have <coughs> A bunch of consumers have all got, for whom you can all derive these downward sloping curves. When you add them up, you get a squiggly line. Uh, and that is what's known in mathematics as a proof by contradiction. Now, it wasn't an intentional one, it was they didn't want to find this result. They wanted to prove that the market demand curve had the same characteristics as the individual. Uh, but they started by assuming the market demand curve has the, does obey the law of demand. And they said, oh, what are the conditions under which that's true? Now, the conditions under which that was true contradicted the initial assumptions. So the initial assumptions were that you could have uh, any preferences you liked and any relative prices you liked, any, any distribution of income you liked. 
And when they fed that into the model, they found, well, that gives you any, uh, any the market demand curve looks like a squiggly line. So to make it a straight line, you have to have completely fixed income distributions. It, it's, I'll, I'll take you through the logic here. Um, you take an individual who's got this utility function, which is where you can describe them using these indifference curves. You vary one price while keeping prices and incomes constant, like this. So that's, that's where you start from, as I showed you in that earlier slide. And then you take those three points. So these are your expensive, cheap, uh, cheaper and very cheap price for bananas, which are P1, P2 and P3. And you take the quantities Q1, Q2 and Q3 that they chose and draw a line linking them. You've got a downward sloping demand curve. And they want that to become the same thing as the market level. So what you're assuming is you can vary price without varying income, which is what's happening over here. So that pivot point doesn't move. And you can also argue that you can compensate for any changes in income and, uh, and relative prices. So if you take a look at those three prices that I've shown you earlier, and you say, well, let's imagine we want to keep the person on a constant level of, of utility, given those different prices. Can we take income away from them and keep them just as well off? And that's just saying, well, yeah, we can find points of tangency to one indifference curve that shows just one level of, of utility and satisfaction. And that's how they get what's called the Hicksian compensated demand curve, which is an important part of working out the, the, uh, mark, the uh, behavior of a single individual. Now, what they were trying to do is say, well, do we get the same result? Can we do the same thing for the whole economy and get this downward sloping line? And the answer was no. So what's going on here? Well, again, as I've said, each time you change prices, you're going to change incomes. And everybody's got different tastes. You know, you might like normal Coke. I can't, I can't drink it. I get too fat. Sugar gets dangerous for older people. We gain weight. So I won't. You go to a shop and you take the, open the Coke. Uh, fridge will take out the stuff with sugar and it'll take out the sugar with the stuff without it. Everybody differs in tastes. Uh, I like, like different music to you. I'm going to go back to the Blues Brothers and the Beatles. I don't know how much you guys would enjoy that sort of music. So tastes differ between every individual. And we also have different income sources. Okay? I sell different things. I sell my view about economics, if you like. You, will be, you might be working in a... You might own a Kmart shop. You might become uh, the next uh, Branson, but you'll earn your income very differently than me. So we're going to have different consumers. They've all got to have different tastes and they all have to have to have different sources of income. Otherwise, you've only got one consumer. And then tastes have to change with income. So if I have a you know, relatively poor as an academic and I've got a certain level of expenditure, if I suddenly became a, a um, hedge fund manager making a fortune, I think my, my pattern of consumption would change. Like, uh, if I got 10 times the income I've got now, I don't think I'd eat 10 times as many pizzas. Okay? So these things have to vary with income as well. So I'm going to take you an example, and just imagine we have this totally isolated example now of Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday, the classic uh, story, on a desert island somewhere, and all the desert island has is coconuts and bananas, and we're going to assume that Crusoe owns the bananas and Friday owns the coconuts, so they both you know, own, own goods. And coconuts are the necessity and bananas are the luxury. And Friday happens to prefer coconuts more so than Crusoe does. So we then take a look at this and say, what happens if we start with an arbitrary ratio of prices? So here's Crusoe and here's Friday. And I'm going to presume a set of indifference curves for Crusoe showing what Crusoe's tastes are. I'm going to leave them off Friday, but I'm going to say they're different, different to that. And then we have one relative price for coconuts to... Uh, bananas, and that gives you a consumption level for um, Crusoe and a consumption level for Friday. Now I have to consider a lower price for bananas, so that's a flatter line. Now if I now drop that down, Crusoe is going to, Crusoe actually owns the banana, bananas. So because bananas are now cheaper, he's going to learn his, earn less income. Whereas Friday, relatively, is going to be well better off. So you drop that down, and you're going to find that it's a flatter curve for Crusoe than beforehand, but the pivot point is lower. So the amount he's going to consume is going to be different. Whereas for Friday, a flatter line, but he actually makes more money, relatively, because the cost of bananas is now cheaper. So what's quite possible there is that market demand for bananas can fall 
because the price of bananas has fallen, which is not what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to rise. But now, including income distribution effects, we can get something totally different. So Crusoe income has, has fallen because of the drop in prices of bananas. Friday's income has risen, but Friday doesn't particularly like bananas, so he's going to buy less bananas. So by dropping the price of bananas, both the demand for it and the price can fall at the same time. Now, what about trying to compensate for changes in prices affecting incomes? Well, that becomes a problem when you look at more than one consumer as well, because here we have, again, the same basic pattern, and now we're looking at moving that budget line out, so saying a higher income for everybody. So imagine we double the number of coconut trees and banana trees on this island, what actually happens. We push that curve out, keeping the relative prices constant. Because bananas are a luxury, both of them, over, as their income grow, are going to consume more bananas relative to coconuts. So Crusoe income is going to rise by more than Fridays in that case, because he's the one who owns the, co- owns the bananas. So you push that out, he goes up further than Friday does. So you can't compensate for the income effect. Okay? You can't neutralise the situation of a rising income and get that to the same level of utility. So a uniform increase in income changes the distribution of income. And notice one thing I'm talking about emphatically here, income distribution. You can't talk about income distribution when you have a single agent, a single consumer. So the theory that's derived for a single consumer with a downward sloping demand curve has to ignore the distribution of income. When you look at the overall society, you must include the distribution of income. And that, therefore, says what's the relationship between one person and another. And it's just like the water molecule situation. When you've got an isolated molecule of H2O, you can't talk about how it interacts with other molecules. You're assuming they're not there. So what it does in isolation is very different to what it will do when you combine it with another molecule. And that's what I'm showing you here. You get very different results. So what that means is you get a a demand curve you can derive for either the bananas or coconuts in that case will have any shape you like. Okay, depending on what you take as the taste being, any polynomial can result from adding up those demands because varying those prices is varying in- income distribution and that's not part of what you've actually used to derive those individual curves because you can't. So the only way to avoid that situation and get this idea that there's a downward sloping demand curve for the individual which scales to applying for the whole society is to say, well, let's assume consumers have got identical tastes. So we rule out the possibility that uh, Crusoe and, uh, Fr- and Friday have different tastes. They've got the same taste for bananas and coconuts. Now, even that's not enough okay? because that alone gets that gets rid of the the price effect, but it doesn't change the, change the income distribution effect. That is, the number of trees on the island rises, keeping the ratio of coconut trees and banana trees constant. To keep on doing that, you're going to change the distribution of income because the ones are luxury, the others are necessity. So you've also got to assume that tastes don't, cha- taste don't change with income. You have to assume that everybody consumes in exactly the same ratio of coconuts to bananas whether you're consuming one a day or a hundred a day of each. Okay. Now, that contradicts your initial assumption. You started off assuming you had two consumers with different tastes and two different commodities. So you, what you've actually done is proof by contradiction that you cannot derive a market demand curve from an individual. You've got to look at the interactions. Now, Neoclassicals are rather torn. They did not want to reach this result. This is not a dis- this is not a discovery they wanted to make. So how did they handle it? Well, they, having got to this particular point, now I'm just repeating myself a bit there. They they do this sort of thing. Okay, they continue doing it even after they prove they can't do it. Okay. What's more valid is this. Now, I'm not saying that, it, that market demand curves have that shape. Okay? Market demand curves, I'm quite happy to say that the price of something that drops is likely to mean the demand rises. Quite happy to assume that. What I'm saying is neoclassical economists cannot prove something they take for granted. Okay? Using their own theory, they can't prove this result of a downward sloping market demand curve. 
So what they should have said, well, market demand curves can't be guaranteed to slope downwards, so we can't actually do this micro-macro stuff. We can't derive the macro from the micro. We have to think about something else. But instead of doing it, this is the sort of thing you'll read in the textbooks. Now, this one is actually... This is a this is not textbook. I actually started with a, an honest statement in the research papers. This is from a thing called the Handbook of Mathematical Economics. I think it's a three-volume set about this thick, okay? heavily mathematically laden. And this is how these particular researchers who found this discovery communicated that in this research paper. And they said, market demand functions, which is the aggregate thing, need not satisfy in any way the classical restrictions on the consumer demand function, meaning this idea of the downward sloping demand curve. So, uh, so the strong restrictions, they say, are needed to justify that a market demand curve has the functions of an individual, only in special cases. Now, really, those special cases just don't exist. Special cases are everybody's got the same tastes and everybody consumes goods in the same ratio. It's, it's a non-existent special case. And so the, what they do find out say at the end is the utility hypothesis, which is this idea of explaining the individual consumer using utility curves, tells us nothing about the mark demand curve unless it's augmented by additional requirements, which include things like the distribution of income. Now, the statements compared... That's what it said in a research paper. It's, it's convoluted, but it's reasonably honest. This is from a postgraduate research book called Darien. He says, It is sometimes convenient to think of aggregate demand as the demand of some representative consumer. Okay. The conditions under which this is done are quite stringent, and the discussion of this issue is beyond the scope of this book. Otherwise, I'm not going to tell you how. Now, this is a book which actually revels in being mathematical. Okay. And here he's saying, oh, here's a complicated thing I'm not going to tell you about, which is really, you know, don't look at this problem. And I love, uh, one thing I, I love looking at is how people change their language over time as they write different editions of books because they're trying to hide results like this. Even if they're not conscious, that's what they're doing. They are trying to hide them. So in the second edition of this book, he said, this demand function can in fact be rationalised by a representative consumer. Now, even though rational is put across as a good thing, rationalised, we all know, is, let's pretend. You know, let's, let's, let's just sweep some little problems under the carpet and pretend. Um, so rationalise is a negative word. What is he used in the third generation, third edition? This demand function can in fact be generated by a representative consumer. Generated? Oh, well, that's, that's the result of applying some logic. So even the way he used his language changed over time. And undergraduate texts are even worse. Paul Samuelson is my favourite here, and I'll show you why in a moment. This is his microeconomic textbook. And this really set the pattern. This book dominates how economic textbooks are written and it has for 50 or 60 years. He says, the market demand curve is found by adding up together the quantities demanded by all individuals at each price. He then says, um, does the market demand curve obey the law of downward sloping demand? What does he say? It certainly does. Emphatically contradicting the logic I've just taken you through. And he goes through and making a little argument there. That's provably false statement. But the funny thing is, Samuelson thought he proved it was true. And I want to show you how he tried to thought he proved it. So he starts by saying the problem is that uh, how can we defend using uh, indifference curves for an entire economy now? So using that indifference curve analysis to represent an entire economy. How do we defend that for a country or a group of individuals? Well, we can claim that the, notice this, countries inhabited by a number of identical individuals with identical tastes. See? And, and also identical endowments of goods. So there's distribution of incomes ruled out and different tastes are ruled out. And he said, well, that's a bit of an improvement of Robinson Crusoe. They're pretty unrealistic. So we can't do that. But he says, well, we can do it for a family, though, because the preferences of different members of a family are related by, what's, by consensus or social, social welfare function that takes into account the deservedness or the ethical worths for the consumption levels of each of the individuals. And so the family acts as if it's one individual, maximising its own utility by reallocating income among, among the members of the family so as to keep the marginal social significance of every dollar equal. So in other words, we're all, every last one of us lives in a big, happy family. Now, I don't want to put anybody on the spot here, but does that sound realistic to you? OK? That's bad enough. But look what he does next. He says... Let's assume the whole economy is one big happy family. 
So the same argument will apply to all of society. I'm not joking, this is actually in a published research paper. If optimal reallocations of income can be assumed to keep the ethical worth of each person's marginal dollar equal. So the whole society sits down and decides how much is Bill Gates really worth? How much is that homeless person really worth? Everybody is absolutely happy about redistributing income, taking it from the homeless person, giving it to Bill Gates, to make the whole society better off and feel happy. And he then says, that's a rigorous proof of a social community function with exactly the same properties as individuals. Otherwise, he's willing to assume that the whole of America is one big happy family who get together and decide what everybody's actually worth and redistribute income so everybody's got the ethically desirable level of income. Now, again, that's why I say, you know, what are these guys on when they come up with this stuff? Uh, it is just, you know, not sure of zombie or stone person. I mean, just think, how on earth can you argue that? It's because you want to reach this result so much that you're willing to destroy logic to come up with these arguments. Now, what I find remarkable is that the text that dominates how PhD students are taught in America is actually written by, I think he's Spanish, Mas Colel, uh, a Spanish economist, microeconomic theory, and he actually talks about the problem. So he says, when can we repeat compute meaningful measures of aggregate welfare? In other words, when, when can we treat the whole as like being one big individual? He said, when there's a fictional individual whose utility maximisation problem is exactly the same as the whole of society's. And there's also got to be a social welfare function that expresses society's judgment of how different people have to be compared to work out um, social, inc- so social outcomes. So it's just insane, I'm afraid to say, because they didn't want to reach this conclusion. They didn't want to find that they had to talk about income distribution to actually derive a demand curve. They wanted to assume they could start from an isolated individual and work up, and they've proven they can't but they pretend they can. So let's take a bit of a break there. That's pretty heavy-duty stuff, I know, the first thing on a Friday morning. And as I said, you're going to be set exam questions at some point which assume this stuff is all accurate. Now, it's not, okay? But you can still answer that exam question. You can pretend, okay? And you can pretend much more easily because you know what's right. So I'll see you again in about 10 minutes' time. About five minutes past the hour, we'll start the second half. Again? Okay, what I'm, I've, I've talked about the demand curve and the theory can't derive the demand curve the way it wants to and the same thing is going to apply with this idea about rising marginal cost as well. So I'm going to start with a bit of an overall description about the theory because it says that there's diminishing marginal productivity is a term you'll find throughout economics and I want to take you through the basic idea. Well, imagine what it's saying is that there's some... Say you want to dig holes. Let's say your industry is digging holes and you use a jackhammer for that and you need a worker for the jackhammer. Well, obviously, there's an ideal ratio of capital to labour in this case, one jackhammer per worker. And the theory goes, well, in the short run, the firm has a fixed number of jackhammers. Let's say it has six jackhammers. And it has to, to dig the hole. That's its fixed cost to the jackhammers. So to dig holes, it has to hire workers. And it starts with one worker. Well, what does the one worker have to do? Well, the one worker has to operate six jackhammers, which is pretty difficult, you know. And if that sounds weird, it's supposed to be weird. I just want to put part of the theory in, in context with a simple example. So what happens, the theory argues effectively that one worker tries to operate all six jackhammers at once, which isn't going to work all that well. The second worker, it means that each of them got three to handle, and then the third worker each is handling just two, which might actually be possible. And then finally you get to the stage where finally you have one worker per jackhammer, which is the situation you want, Okay, six workers, six jackhammers. But to increase output beyond that, you have to have additional workers with a fixed number of jackhammers. So you've got to have two workers per jackhammer, which is pretty pretty crazy. Okay. But that's the sort of theory that you get this idea about being able to have a variable ratio between labour and capital in producing output. And the argument goes here that you can produce more, uh, you dig more holes with two workers on each jackhammer than you can with one, but not twice as many holes, diminishing marginal productivity, etc., etc. Um, so that's the basic theory they've got, that you're going to have rising productivity as you add more workers to the jackhammers, but after you get past three or four workers per jackhammer, uh, then you're going to have 
declining uh, marginal productivity. It doesn't become negative, but it continues falling. And that's the idea that lies behind this idea of variable ratios of labour to capital, which sounds, when you talk about it in a textbook way, it starts off sounding reasonable. Put it in an example, it looks stupid. The example is more sensible than the textbook. Uh, but I want to go through the critique that has been made of this argument, which again the mainstream ignores. And that's uh, a guy called Piero Schraffa, was the person who did this way back in the 1920s. Schraffa's played two very important roles in economics, one in the 20s and the other in the 60s, both of which has been ignored by the mainstream largely, but very, very important arguments. And he said, when you have... Um, this idea of diminishing marginal productivity argues you have one input which is fixed, another which is variable, and to get more output you've got to change the variable, and you use all the fixed outputs. That's the theory. Use them all at the same time. Uh, and that gives you the rising supply curve argument because if that's the case, you're going to get diminishing marginal productivity, and that means you're paying the same amount for the workers, but you're getting less output from each of them, so your costs rise as you increase the output. And you need to do this because if you're going to have supply and demand analysis at all, I'm now letting them get away with the downward sloping market demand curve and saying, can you get the upward sloping supply curve as well? Uh, well, they've got to be independent of each other. Okay. If, you, if there's a different demand curve for every different supply curve, then you can't talk about points of equilibrium, make easy comparisons. They have to be intellectually independent from each other. Well, what Strafford did back in 1926 was say this whole idea of a fixed factor is pretty silly. He says, if you define a factor and an industry very broadly, let's say you talk about the factor being capital, so you're talking about all the machinery that's used to produce all output in the entire economy, and agriculture, so you're talking about all the types of foods produced in all the lands in all of, all of England, then if you're going to use one of those factors more intensely, if you use more labour or more machinery in agriculture, you're going to drive up the price of machinery or labour. You're going to have to hire so many more workers to have an impact or so many more machines going to be hired to have an impact that you're going to change the income of one of those factors of production. And when you change that income, that's going to therefore mean your demand curve shifts because you've changed your supply curve. So you can't have independent supply and demand analysis at that scale. And the basic idea there, I think I'll give a couple of diagrams to illustrate it later, but at that scale, you cannot have separate demand and supply curves. So to talk in terms of factors of production and driving up the marginal cost of production and so on, you've got to be talking very, very narrowly instead. And so rather than talking about machinery, you've got to talk about a particular type of machine, like, say, a stapling gun for making cardboard boxes. Um, well, if you talk about that level, so you're saying stapling guns, then you can't say stapling guns are fixed because you can buy other stapling guns. If you're running low on stapling gun supplies, you can go to a local you know, hardware shop and buy some more, or you can buy some off a rival firm that doesn't have quite as much demand as you. So what's going to happen, consequently, is you won't affect the price in other industries, and you'll have a trivial impact upon the demand for cardboard boxes. So it's quite... Uh, um, it doesn't have a, a demand effect, which you're trying to avoid. But what you're going to do is have an ideal ratio between your labour and your capital at all times. For each stapling gun, you're going to have one worker, not two, and not half a worker. So you're going to employ your capital and your labour in a fixed ratio, which happens to be the ideal ratio. And therefore, you're not going to get diminishing marginal productivity. If you want to produce more cardboard boxes, and you, uh, you know, demands up for cardboard boxes, so you'll, and you have five workers and five stapling guns, when the demand doubles, you'll have 10 workers and 10 stapling guns, and your productivity per worker will be constant. You won't have a drop-off in productivity. So therefore, your, card, your cardboard box output is going to be a linear function of the number of workers you hire because your workers are being used in a fixed ratio of machines to labour. And so marginal product will be constant, and therefore marginal cost is also constant. So what Schraffer said, it's either if you want to do independent supply and demand curves... Uh, then you're going to get a different demand curve for every point in the supply curve like this. So this is, this is where you say you're looking at the level of agriculture as your industry and capital as your factor of production or labour as your factor of production. Then every point in the supply curve 
is going to have a different demand curve associated with it because there'll be a different distribution of income applying there. Or you're going to have a constant ratio of capital to labour in the industry. So as you increase your labour input, you're going to continue hiring more and more machinery to match them, and you're going to get a straight line for your cost of production versus your output level. And when you take a look at that in terms of a marginal product curve or a marginal cost curve, you're going to get a constant marginal cost. So that's the logical argument that Schreffer made back in 1926 to say this, this idea about rising marginal costs are coming out of diminishing marginal productivity just doesn't make sense. And then when you do that, if you actually have this sort of situation where you, you, you work, you use your, you know, your, again back to the example I gave about digging holes, you have one worker per uh, jackhammer, and if you have six jackhammers and only one worker to start with, then only the worker just uses one jackhammer. A lot of five remain idle. An extra worker gets to the end of the six, two, three, four, five, and six. Once you have six workers, if you need to expand the output to a seventh worker, then you go and hire a seventh jackhammer from somewhere, and you get constant productivity in producing those holes. You never have two workers and one jackhammer. You never have one worker operating two jackhammers at once. It's always going to be this fixed ratio. And if you do that, then your costs are going to be the cost of the, let's say you're going back to the cardboard box situation, you've got a factory where you make the cardboard boxes, you've got production lines where you produce the cardboard boxes, you don't use all the production lines until demand is at that level, but throughout the whole way you've got a constant marginal cost and you're producing more and more output out of the same factory, so the factory cost is fixed and as you use higher capacity your average costs fall because your fixed cost per unit declines, so average cost falls down like that with a constant marginal cost. And marginal cost is always below the average cost. So that's the situation that Schraff has said logically makes sense. And as it happens, way, way back in the 1930s, a bunch of economists at Oxford called the Oxford Study Group thought they could improve economics by having meetings between economists and business people. And that the business people thought the same thing, so off the business people trotted to Oxford to have a meeting with these incredibly intelligent economists. And the business people completely couldn't understand what the economists were talking about because all the assumptions the economists made about marginal cost rising and marginal productivity, etc., etc., just didn't sound like what the business people did at all. They were quite puzzled, both the business people and the, and the economists. So a few of the economists thought, we better actually go and survey businesses and see what they do. And I've got a number of the names here that have been occurred. That's, I've got about 10, 15 names there. It's been about 100 studies that have done this sort of work over time. And the last one was done by a guy called Alan Blinder. Now, I know you won't know the name Alan Blinder. You know the name Ben Bernanke? Okay. Alan Blinder was Ben Bernanke's deputy at one stage. And he's also been, I think, deputy president of the American Economic Association. So he's a highly ranked, highly respected, conventional economist. And he did the survey in 1998, and he found the same results as everybody else did. So when these firms are surveyed, the results that came back from the firms say, well, first of all, marginal revenue and marginal cost are irrelevant concepts. They they don't work with those terms. And in fact, rather than revenue falling after a certain point, every extra sale adds to profit. So the whole idea of a sales team is to sell as many units as possible. There's not this need, and if you think about the supply and demand analysis, that says at some point where if you sell more than that number of units, you actually lose money. That's, that comes out of the theory, which means what a sales manager would be doing if that were real is sitting on the phone getting ready to call the sales staff saying, stop selling. Our marginal cost is now equal to our marginal revenue. If you sell another unit, we'll lose money. Don't sell that extra car. Do you think that call's ever been made? Never. Okay? It's a myth. When you think about it, even logically, what we know in our own experience, that's nonsense. The sales manager's job is to maximise sales, period. And they never get sacked because they sell too many cars. It's just nonsense to think that way. But we've been fooled to say that. I mean, it's just nonsense. So that's never going to happen. But it's part of the mental framework we have in our minds from the supply and demand analysis. And we're right. The real world feeling we have that that's just crazy is actually correct. So there's something wrong with the theory. And this is the whole argument that costs rise as output rises. In fact, what you find is average costs tend to fall for most firms as output rises until they reach capacity. And of course, 
if they're heading towards reaching capacity, a well-managed firm is going to be investing in a new factory straight away. In fact, their problem is going to be balancing this expansion with their financial costs. That's much more, much more relevant for that particular firm. So most firms operate well within capacity. They're not at the margin. And why did they do that? Because if you build a factory, and on day one when you're using the factory, it's at full capacity, you've built too small a factory. So when you build a factory, you'll, you'll have at least 30% or 40% capacity of that factory not utilised because that means the factory can last for three or four years and you don't need to build a new factory until you, get to 100%, you start approaching the 100% level. So it makes sense to have unutilised capacity at all times. So there's idle machinery there waiting to be used because if you don't have it there, you've got to build a whole new factory, which is bad management. So what, cusp, what actually happens, this is a, one of my favourite studies, it was done back in the 1950s. And this is how long this stuff has been known for, by the way, and it doesn't become part of the theory. Uh, these two economists, Eitman and Guthrie, sent out a survey to about 500 firms, I think, asking them to look at these various drawings here and say, which of these drawings approximates the situation you think applies in terms of your average cost for your firm? So this particular one here, you can see this one, it has the scale of output and the cost per unit starting low and getting higher as you go towards capacity. And this one has starting low and getting higher again. This one has falling and then rising. Similar here. This one's falling a lot, rising towards the end. This one's falling almost all the way and then a bit of a rise. This falls all the way out. This is starting low and rising high. Which one looks like the textbook drawing you see for average costs? Which one? Who votes for number one? Two? Three? Come on. Three, okay. Four? Three is the most obvious, like a textbook, isn't it? Because what you see, when you see an average cost curve drawn in a textbook, an average cost falling for a while and then rising and marginal cost coming up through the middle here, explaining why the average cost rises. You take a look at your textbooks, number three is what they're going to look like. Okay? And then they also describe, so three to five, you can pretty much describe as being neoclassical, mainstream models of how firms operate. And five, notice to say, they also gave a verbal description, so that five is uh, costs of high minimum output, decline gradually to a least hot point near capacity, after which they rise sharply. That's how they describe five, um, six and seven and so on. Three is really the one that's close to what the textbook says is the situation that applies for all firms. So they sent their survey out and they got the answers back and these are the number of companies that chose different combinations there. Nobody chose one, obviously. There's no theory that says it look like that. Nobody chose two. One firm out of 334 chose three. That's the textbook model. Then you've got a number of people choosing four, some five. Most chose six and seven. Seven was by far the most popular. Let's go back and take a look at seven again. So seven, that's what most firms said applies to them. High average costs, and as production increases, your average cost declines smoothly all the way out. That's what most firms say apply to them. So on all the 18, if you're being very generous and using three, four, and five as being neoclassical in shape, only 18 said that they face diminishing marginal productivity and rising marginal cost. That's that lot there. And three, and really, I'm being very generous to include four and five because they don't look like the textbook, even they're slightly outside the textbook vision. And two-thirds of the firm said they had the lowest unit cost at maximum output. That's number seven. Okay. So the theory that we get taught in the textbooks, at best suits about 5% of firms, and 95% they have constant or falling marginal cost. And that means you can't even get to first base on this idea of deciding how much to produce by equating marginal cost and marginal revenue. For that to work, marginal cost has to be rising. Otherwise, average cost is going to be above marginal cost, which that whole thing about fixed cost being part of the average cost. So you find out that in the, in the series, the best you get is when you're looking by products, maybe one in 20 of the real firms actually suit the model. Um, much the same thing with looking by products. This is more of a breakdown of that Eichmann and Guthrie study. So what's happened with diminishing marginal productivity? Why doesn't it apply? Well, 
engineers design factories. Factories are not made by economists, thank God, otherwise they wouldn't work. Um, and how do they design them? This is a this is one of the economists interpreting the results they got. Engineers design factories so as to cause the variable factor, which labour, to be used most efficiently when the plant is operating close to capacity. So the whole idea is to design the factory so when it's working at 100% capacity, it's the highest efficiency it can get. Okay, it approaches that efficiency as you start using more and more labour. He then said, under such conditions, the average variable cost curve declines steadily until you get capacity utilisation. So a marginal cost curve derived from that lies below the average cost at all scales. And therefore, it's physically impossible to decide how much to maximise profit by equating marginal cost and marginal revenue. You've got to do something else. So, and this is quite funny when you see how some of the survey respondents reply. There's a lot of, these days, a huge number of people who work in firms end up doing an economics degree and they'll swallow some of this stuff in various ways, even though they work in factories where it doesn't apply. But back then, that didn't happen. There weren't that many economists getting jobs in firms. So this is a very interesting response by one of the factory owners to the thing being told what economists actually believe. And he actually thought the economists were a radical conspiracy against business. He says, the amazing thing is any sane economist could consider the three, four, and five as representing business thinking. It looks as if economists assuming a premise that business is not progressive or dumb, basically, but trying to prove the premise by suggesting curves like numbers three, four, and five. So even with low efficiency and premium pay of overtime work, so he's now taking the real world situation where if you want to hire more workers, maybe you've got to pay overtime after a certain point. Our unit cost would still decline with these increased production since the absorption of fixed costs would more than offset the added direct expenses occurred. So because fixed costs are so important, so dominant in most firms, the variable costs are going to decline, even if you're paying higher wages for people to do that. So marginal cost for most firms is constant or slopes downwards uh, because of increasing efficiency to gross capacity, and it always lies below the average cost curve. So costs are always falling in that way. So that's the theory itself makes a set of assumptions about reality that don't apply. And if I wanted to guess as to why, it's because the sort of vision that economists formed was back in the days when agriculture was still the leading industry. And you can imagine variable amounts of labour being applied to land. Okay, and it made sense that if you had a... The more workers you add, you get more output. Ultimately, they start trampling the plants after a certain point. So with agriculture, it seems to make sense. But even there, it doesn't. Because if you had a farm... Let's say this room was a farm. And let's say the ideal productivity ratio was one worker per 50 square metres. I'm not sure how much 50 square metres is of this room, but let's say it's up to the front set of benches here. Then the sensible thing, we have only one worker and that 50 square metres out of 250 in the whole room. You just get the worker to plant on the 50 square metres and ignore the other 200. And when you get a second worker, you lose the 100 of the 250. And then a third... I use 150 acres, you leave some parts of the capital untouched. It's actually less productive to get the worker working over 250 square metres when the best ratio is one worker per 50. You produce less output if you make them work the entire 250 and if you say ignore 200 and just use 50. So even agriculture, it doesn't make sense. But that's, that's where this model came from. Now, other parts of the theory also try to assume that the demand curve for the individual firm is a horizontal straight line. And this is something I've done, which annoys the economists immensely, but in fact, looking back, way back in the 1950s, you find a very prominent mainstream economist making the beginnings of the case that I'm making here. So Stigler, talking about this model of perfect competition where individual firms are supposed to face a horizontal demand curve, um, he wrote a paper called Perfect Competition Historically Contemplated. There's a survey paper in the very first volume of this journal back in 1957. Now, what he argued was that the demand curve facing the individual firm has got exactly the same slope, slope as the demand curve, the slope of the entire market demand curve. And I want to take you through the logic of that. Now, he wasn't a radical, and this is not a radical journal. It's actually one of the mainstream journals. And this guy was one of the main defenders of conventional theory and actually fought 
a lot of the people who did that survey work and said don't bother reading the survey work they're doing. So he's not a conservative at all. But he did some accurate mathematics and didn't like the result. But what he found was, he said the market, the individual demand curve for a firm has the same slope as the market demand curve. What's going on there? Well, if you have a market demand curve that slopes downwards, let's assume that's happening, it's income distribution rather than behaviour of the consumer that will give you that, but let's assume you've got that, and you take one small tiny segment of it, so here's your market demand curve, and let's just say there's, there's the quantity Q, which is the market output of a particular point, and there's market price P, and you consider a higher, much higher quantity being produced, and therefore a much lower price, so you've got a change in price across the two. Let's say you're seeing from a let's say a single firm now is producing the amount Q, adding on to that, and they change a tiny amount of their output, little d Q, then that little point there, that little bit there, is going to have the same slope as the overall market demand curve. That's the graphical intuition. So the little DP is going to be the same as the big DP. And how do you get a horizontal demand curve? You know, well, you look at what happens in textbooks. They they give you this idea of horizontal demand curve. Well, they use magic. You know what magic is, don't you? Okay. Magic is distracting your attention to something else while you do something the person doesn't see that appears to be magic. Okay. So how do they distract you? Well, what they do is you visually zoom in on the demand curve. So you've had a demand curve like this, and there's the demand curve. And I'm zooming in on a small part of that demand curve. But what the theory does is zooms in the whole vertical bit and just a bit of the horizontal. Okay. So you zoom in that bit and then you magnify it. And you come out and what you get is a curve that's flatter. Okay. You've taken a small bit on the horizontal and the entire range on the vertical. You do it again. So you take that little bit there. So you take the, the take the whole area I'm showing there around the demand the market price. Take that out. Getting close to horizontal, aren't we? Okay. What I'm distracting you with, I'm not telling you I'm zooming in on the entire range of one axis, but only a small bit of the other axis. Okay. But what if I do actually zoom in? You see where the ripple rectangle is there? Now what I'm doing is rather than zooming in the whole area, I'm zooming a bit of the vertical and a bit of the horizontal. So I zoom in on there, and I expand that out, I get a curve with the same slope as the previous one. If I do it again, on that bit, and zoom out there, I get that. So all of a sudden the magic has disappeared. Keep on doing it, all the way down. You're now looking at the scale that an individual firm might be looking at. I'm looking about a two point. I've got uh, huge quantities here. I tend to use large numbers because I think it's more realistic than the toy numbers you see in the textbook. So I've got 2.92 by 10 to the 10 to the 9 units of output. I might be only grains of wheat here, and that's 2.93 by 10 to the 9. And then the price change is between 507 and 508. I think the firm could see those differences. So it's it's false to say that that the firm, the the curve is horizontal. It's not. It's the same the same shape as the as the market demand curve, as the individual demand curve if you can derive one. Now Stigler didn't expect to see that result. He got a surprise, I think. And so he thought, well, can I rework it till I get rid of the problem? And he said, Well yes I can. And this is a bit of mathematics here, so I don't expect people to reproduce this, but it's showing you can use mathematics to critique mainstream economics. So he starts off by saying firms equate marginal cost and marginal revenue to make a profit. And this is the idea. So marginal um, revenue starts as being price times the quantity you produce, which is two things multiplied by together, and you want to differentiate them with respect to QI, quantity to the i firm. So that becomes P plus QI times the slope of the demand curve. And what he then does is says, well, that's and that's that's where you get a downward sloping curve for the individual firm, which is the result he didn't like. So you then say, well, let's multiply this by P over P by Q over Q, so you don't change anything. So if you do that, I bring P over P and Q over Q inside here. And then he says, well, let's now define the output of the I firm as Q divided by N, where N's not the number of firms in the industry. So you do that, you've now produced 
you now have got, uh, rather having QI here, you now have Q divided by N. So you've got a whole lot of Qs there. And you can rearrange your Ps and your Qs. And when you rearrange it, you get this expression. So after all that shuffling around, you finally say this thing here is equal to... So we've started up here, but the slope of the individual firm's demand curve is price plus QI, the output of the firm, times the slope of the market demand curve. He's now got it being equal to P plus price times 1 over the number of firms times Q over P times DP DQ. Now that is a term which you would have worked with. It's the inverse of what's called the elasticity of demand. How much does the, the amount demanded change given a change in the price? So if let's substitute that with 1 over E. So he's finally reworked this whole thing to say that the marginal revenue for the I firm is market price plus market price divided by the number of firms multiplied by the elasticity of the demand curve. And he then says, this last term goes to zero as the number of firms goes to infinity. Okay. Now that is true. That is mathematically correct. He hasn't made a mathematical error there at all. Okay? I'm not saying there's anything wrong there. This is just a couple of problems there. And the most important one is I can prove that equating marginal cost and marginal revenue doesn't maximise profits. What he's assuming is the firm is going to set this equal to marginal cost to maximise profits. But once you say that this here is the slope of the... that the demand curve slopes downwards to the individual firm, then it's no longer true that equating marginal cost and marginal revenue maximises profits. So the neoclassical argument says if you set these two equal... So that's the whole argument I had about the hill beforehand. So you've got a the lower... Uh, you're going through a mountain range, you're going from a low point to a high point. Okay? Two roads to get there the cost road and the revenue road. The marginal cost is the slope of the of the, the cost of the lower one, the marginal revenue is the slope of the higher one. When the two slopes are equal, the gap's the biggest between them. That's true for an individual firm, OK? But it doesn't maximise profits when you're in an industry. And this, again, is an interaction between a range of different firms because you're not the only firm walking that mountain, effectively. So, mathematically, what the conventional theory tells you to do is working out what's called an ordinary differential. You find where the derivative of your profit relative to your output is zero. But you're a firm in an industry, and your profits don't just depend upon what you do. They also depend upon what other firms do in the same industry, which you can't control, and you don't necessarily even know what it is. But they exist. So the real profit maximising is not to look at the gap between your revenue and your profit, your, your costs, is to look at what's called the total differential, which takes into account um, the, how your profit changes relative to what the entire industry does, even if you can't control it. That's the real profit maximising point. Now, the problem is, and I want to set this up as a bit of a joke, imagine you had a, a wealthy capitalist having two staff, one a mathematician, the other an economist. He says, work out the level of output that maximises my profits. Now, I'm still assuming here... I've now gone back to say, let's even assume that marginal cost rises, which I know it doesn't, but I just want to say, even if that applied, the theory is wrong. Well, he tells an economist, the economist says, oh, it's pretty simple. All I have to do is equate marginal cost and marginal revenue. That'll work out the maximum profit point. But the guy's also hired a mathematician, and the mathematician says, ah, oh, it's an interesting problem. To solve it, I've got to work out the total differential. So the total derivative of profit equal to zero. This does get mathematically hairy. I don't expect you to reproduce this stuff, but it's to give me an idea. So the total derivative is where price times quantity, which is the, the, the revenue for the firm, minus total cost for that producing level of output, is zero relative not to change in the firm's output, but change in the industry's output. So you have to find this point. Rather than, rather than having little q down here, qi, I've got big q. And that's the true mathematical problem. Now, solving that's slightly more complicated than what you've done, more than I expect you to know too, uh, certainly in the first year. Um, the neoclassical thing actually does, effectively does that for one firm and only one firm. Okay, so that's what it's actually doing. So rather than having big Q for the entire industry, it just looks at it for one firm and says, let's set that to zero. Now, the total differential says, let's work out this bit 
for every firm in the industry and add them all up. Okay, that's the change in the I firm's profits, given a change in the J firm's output. And so you get affected by what other firms do, even if you can't control the other firms. If you don't know what that is, they still affect you. So you need to work across that term and sum it up across all the firms in the industry, and then. When you solve for your output in that term, that'll tell you the profit maximising level. So if I take that, uh, the revenue side of that, the total revenue, or market revenue for that term, and expand it out, I get this term here. And that, notice that's price of the market price multiplied by how much your output changes, you're the ith firm, given a change in output by the jth firm, which is another firm. Well, if you look at that, the answer is going to be zero. Nine in minus one times, because what another firm does is independent of what you do. You don't you don't one firm changing your output doesn't cause you to change your output directly. So that is going to be where I is not equal to the J, where you're not talking about the individual firm, that's going to be zero. But once you're going to be saying, how do much does I, my output change? Change if I change my output. What's the ratio of my change in output to my change in output? The answer is one. Okay. So once and only once, you're going to get P out of that. Now this bit here is more complicated. That's the output of the individual firm, your output, QI, times how much one firm changing its output affects market price. Now we know that, again, we're having assumed this, that every you can substitute that with the slope of the market demand curve. So I'm going to get n copies of this term because each time it's going to be the slope of the market demand curve multiplied by the output of the i firm. So when I work it out, I get n, n elements of the slope of the market demand curve. Now what about the revenue? We're subtracting total cost. Well, that's the rate of change of total cost of your output, your, Q, your output, given a change in output by another firm. Now it's going to be zero every time except the one time you're looking at your own your own output. So what you find is maximum profit occurs where price plus n times your output times the slope of the market demand curve minus your marginal cost equals zero. That's a true profit maximising point, assuming that marginal cost rises and demand falls. So the neoclassical formula tells you it's price minus Q times. Notice what's happened. They've, locked, they've dropped off the n. Their formula leaves out n as part of the argument, means the number of firms in the industry. So that's the real error in the logic. By focusing upon the ordinary differential, how much your profit change is given a change in your output, ignoring what the rest of the industry does. Because you live in an industry, you can't do that. So even given their conditions, setting your marginal cost equal to your marginal revenue does not maximize your profits. So it's a huge fallacy in the way that economists think about firms. And this whole, the combination of these two critiques, the, the thing I'm really bringing out is that you can't analyse the economy by starting from an isolated individual consumer or individual firm. You've got to look at the interactions between them. Even if the theory was right in its foundation, which it's not, you have to look at the interactions to get the correct answers. And this is something that physicists realised 40 or 50 years ago and this guy has a Nobel Prize in physics, and I take a Nobel Prize in physics much more seriously than I do one in economics. And you get one in physics, you have to really do something useful. In economics, you have to maintain what people believe in the theory. But he said that some decades ago, physicists realised that the problems they were trying to solve in the 20th century couldn't be solved by reducing everything to its individual parts and then adding up the individual parts and getting the answer. He says because... What this implies is you can understand a huge complicated system by knowing what individual parts of it do. And as I gave you that example of water earlier on, you can't understand water by reducing it to single molecules and saying what single molecules do. You've got to look at the interactions. And so this is the belief you have to work from the individual and go up is what he called constructionism. He said that's the idea is you can reduce to a lower level and then construct the higher level from that lower level. And he said that just doesn't apply. We've found that it simply isn't possible when you look at the impact of scale and complexity on systems. And he says the behaviour of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles, so he's talking about 
and protons and neutrons and gluons and so on, the behavior of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles cannot be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles. This is, and then the argues, you match the statement inside of the, this is an article, a major article called More is Different. So psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. But in effect, what the neoclassical approach to modeling says, macro is applied micro. No, he's saying they're wrong. He said, instead, at every new level, entirely new properties of fear and the understanding of new behaviours requires research which I think is as fundamental in nature as any other. So he's a physicist. They work at the, the deepest level of reality, quantum mechanics and relativity and stuff like that. And he's saying that this conventional view says you can reduce chemistry to applied physics. You can reduce biology to applied chemistry. You can reduce um, humanity to applied biology. He's saying, no, you can't do any of those things. You have to work at different levels all the way through. The whole is not only more of that, but very, but very different to the sum of the parts. And that's what physicists realised 50 or 60 years ago. And I'm, you know, my whole thing is saying it's about time economists caught up. And he does a lovely little exercise here and says you may, like, a, a, you can set up the physics, the sciences in such a way to say that uh, the elementary particles of entity of, of science X obeys the law of science Y. So he drew a table like this, and he says chemistry. Um, is applying, let's just start down at the, the top. Chemistry is applying what we know from many body physics. So the interactions of, of chemicals we can see as being what physics know from the interactions of lots and lots of individual particles. And biology, molecular biology, we can say is based on chemistry. And cell biology is based on molecular biology. And then so psychology is based on physiology. And social sciences are based on psychology. And he says, well, that hierarchy does not imply that science X is just applied Y. Okay. At each new stage, entirely new laws and concepts and generalisations are necessary, requiring inspiration and creativity to just the greatest degrees in the previous one. So from economics, my argument is you cannot reduce macroeconomics to micro. You must work at a whole new level. And he finishes up with that wonderful statement that I've just already used. So my extrapolation of that is to say that macro is not applied micro. Well, that's what the mainstream try to reduce macroeconomics to. So, uh, and this is, again, further statements from Anderson. The ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. And my favourite instance of there, if this was true, a chemistry, a normal question in the biology exam would be take these chemicals and create life. Of course, we know that can't be said as a chemistry. It is a biology exercise, okay? And the same thing for economics. We can't reduce macro to applied micro. So there's two ways you can handle this complexity, and this is the sort of stuff we'll teach you at Kingston. You can use multi-agent models and say all these agents are computer representations of people in the economy. They're all different, and they interact with each other, and their reactions themselves give you phenomena you can't see from just looking at an isolated member of that system. That's work that Antoine Godin does here, one of my PhD students, Tim Godding, is working on as well. Or system dynamics, where you build a system from the top down and look at the feedbacks. And I'll give you a simple example to finish here, which is slightly lighter than what I've done so far. Imagine you've got a couple of uh, lovers, Romeo and Juliet, they've got feelings for each other, and they have feedback about how they feel about how the other feels about them typical sort of thing we see in relationships. So what Romeo feels for Juliet affects what Juliet feels for Romeo in various ways. I'm going to set up a little example and say that Romeo is the sort of character who tends to forget his girlfriend when she's not there. Okay? But when she's around, he likes her company. And then Juliet is somebody who fantasizes about Romeo when he's not around, but when he's around, he annoys her. Does that sound realistic? No relationships like that? People like that? Well, what you can say there is the change in Romeo's love is some constant time his current love, and that'll be a positive constant, a negative constant, pardon me, because he tends to forget about her unless she's there, plus another constant which is going to be positive times what Juliet feels for him. Whereas Juliet, she's going to be basically the same structure, but she's going to be positive for her when she, to her, her love just grows on its own basis. But when he's around, it's negative. The D is going to be negative. So those are my constants there. And I'm going to show love as a positive number, 
and indifference by a zero and hate as a negative, what do you think is going to happen? Any ideas? They're going to be hating each other, loving each other, indifferent. What do you think? Any ideas? You've got to actually simulate this sort of stuff and a software package that I've developed called Minsky is part of what engineers do to model dynamic systems like this. Minsky is a part of a whole genre of software packages. What it does that the others can't do is model money uh, more effectively. So I've brought it in there. And let's just take a look at what happens with Romeo and Juliet. So this is a flow chart that says, here's Romeo's love for Juliet multiplied by the constant A. Oh, pardon me, I can't get rid of that. Ah, I unfortunately accidentally brought down another object. I've got to get rid of it. But that's gone. OK. Uh, uh, will it still run? I better check and see if it'll run after I've made that mistake. Yes, it does. OK. Um, so that's a constant times Romeo's job for love for Juliet added to another constant multiplied by Juliet's love for Romeo, the re that's the rate of change of Romeo's love. And then it feeds back around and you have Juliet's love for Romeo and so on. So it's a, a pattern. And in this graph I'm going to be showing what they feel that this is over time. And here I've got Juliet's love, or Romeo's love on the horizontal axis and Juliet's love on the vertical. And what you get when you simulate it, I'll slow it down a bit, is they cycle in and out of love with each other all the time. They go from loving each other to hating each other to one loving and the other hating, etc., etc. And it never settles down. It cycles indefinitely. Do you know relationships like that? Okay. So it's realistic. And you can model by working at that level. You don't have to work from the individual level. You can look at the interactions. We have software packages, mathematical approaches, and so on, that let us handle the interactions that we see in the real world these days. So equilibrium is a major, another major thing neoclassical economists impose upon systems because they think equilibrium means coherence. But I've just shown you a non-equilibrium situation which is quite realistic. And that's the real world. You can get cycles in everything. And I want to finish up with one little example in the economic one. And let's say uh, that you don't, economic models don't have to give you equilibrium either. You've got to be able to handle change through time. So imagine you have a model where it says a certain amount of capital, the number of factors you have, roughly speaking, determine the amount of output you can produce. Output, roughly speaking, determines how many workers you need to hire for those factories. The employment that you get, roughly speaking, determines how much wages change. Output minus wages gives you profit, and profit, roughly speaking, determines how much you're willing to invest. And then investment determines the capital stock. And what that gives you is a causal model that looks a bit like the one I've shown you for Romeo and Juliet there. And what you get out of it is permanent cycles. You don't get equilibrium. So that's the sort of thinking that I'd want economics to, to move towards. Um, we don't have to work from individuals up. We can work from the system down. We don't have to get equilibrium. That's a potential state, of, but very, a real world is always changing. We need to handle the, the real world, the golden world we're in. And I've just actually added a bit to this particular model. I'll just uh, bring this one up. Let's see what I've got here. I haven't checked this line for a while. Okay, That's the same model that I've added in banks into the system. And what I get out of that are complex cycles which have an unexpected dynamic to them. You've got diminishing cycles for a while, then rising cycles. And that's the little model that I developed some decades ago that made me think we're going to be in for a financial crisis after a period of apparent stability, which is what we had happen. So um, basic argument, I think that what the mainstream has done is was OK in the 19th century. It's very primitive for the 21st, and it's time we moved on. And that's really what we're going to be showing you at Kingston in the next few years. Thanks for the school class for coming along. And uh, thanks here. For my own class, we're going to have the... the, the uh, course on data presentation next week with Marianne, and I'll also have the macro essay up for you over the weekend and on study space. Well, thanks a lot. See you next Friday.